you can talk. Okay, we're we're on the air. Uh, hi, sorry for the interruption there. We are having massive problems with new technology and we hit some problems. So you are seeing me. My name is Jim Soper. And we have on the line Jonathan Simon. First of all, this is a live stream interview from Ballots for Bernie. Ball Ballots for Bernie is a group that's been in, a year, in existence for a year and a half now to try to make the country better. They supported Bernie Sanders. And in June in California, when they had the primaries and there were problems with the primaries, we had hundreds of them going out and watching the ballots being counted or recounted. And they connected with the Voting Rights Task Force, of which I am co-chair. And we started a, a coalition, the California Election Integrity Coalition, to to try to unify our skills and bring them together and to advance democracy. So in just in, just as background in case you're tuning in a hundred years later, we just had an election and the apparent victor is Mr. Donald Trump. But a week and a half ago, Jill Stein, candidate for the Green Party, announced that she was going to organize a recount of the vote in Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Michigan. And we are now seeing also uh, efforts for recounts in Nevada by De La Fuente. And Clint Curtis has announced yesterday that he's asking for a recount in Florida. But this really got started I'm not quite sure how fast after the election. It got started a long time before that. Um, for that, we will go to Jonathan Simon and get a little bit of background and then talk about how we got into the recount. Jonathan, you're there. Yep. Hey, Jim. Hey. Okay. Jonathan is the author of a great book called Code Red, which had an update this year. And it's about how elections are being shifted, to use one word. Uh, would you please quickly, uh, for example, explain to folks what a red shift is? Well, a red shift from an a election integrity observer standpoint is when vote counts um, come out to the right, um, of exit poll or other baseline numbers. So if you have an exit poll that, let's say, has a 6% margin for Bernie Sanders, and then you get uh, a vote count with a 3% margin for Hillary Clinton, for instance, as we saw in many cases, or you have a, a exit poll with a margin for Hillary Clinton, and then you wind up with a uh, vote count that is um, a margin for Donald Trump or a lower margin for Clinton, anything that shifts towards the right um, from the exit polls uh, to the vote counts, uh, we refer to it as a red shift. It's you know named after the red states, uh, and it's named after I suppose Doppler and the and the astrophysics. But uh, it's it's just showing that you're having these um, these disparities, uh, and they've become quite chronic and uh, virtually always in the same direction. Uh, where you have exit polls uh, and pre-election polls, for that matter, um, showing a, a better showing for candidates uh, further left on the political spectrum. If that's between the two parties, for the Democratic candidate, if it's within a party, um, for the candidate that is further to the left, and then the vote counts turn out to be more to the right for reasons that we're now trying to find out. Good. Thank you. Uh, and this not across the board in every state all the time, but it has certain peculiarities? Yeah, I mean, and that's the thing. We, we uh, some of us, um, at least, what we're looking for is pattern analysis. And we're looking for what I call second-order comparatives, which really isn't all that complicated. Basically, what it's saying is you see a pattern where the, uh, let's say, the red shift numbers are highly concentrated in certain states, and those states just happen to be
We've seen it before. We saw it in 2004. We've seen it in quite a few elections since. And we saw it really, really floridly um, this year in 2016. Okay. Um, Summarize what he said one more time because... It may have been on a disturbed in. All right. Uh, we, there was a, a little burp in the internet there. Could you summarize that in two sentences, what you just said? <laughs> just Give it a try. It. Um, red shifts are not always evenly distributed. As a matter of fact, most of the time we find them concentrated in states that are important and close in places that are important and close. And that suggests that those places are being targeted for manipulation. And that's why we're seeing a lot more red shifts there. Uh, in, in 2016, for instance, the, the red shift in the states um, that are now being uh, recounted and a few other of the close battleground states was basically three times, more than three times, as much as the red shift uh, across the rest of the country. So it's a pattern. It's not, it's not just random. Um, and uh, it's pretty indicative. It's very suggestive of some problem with the vote counting process. And this is the difference between the exit polls and the announced results. The announced That's preliminary. correct. Okay. The exit polls and the announced results. Um, and, you know, pre-election polls and the announced results as well. And in certain places, hand counts and machine counts. Or in other places, optical scan counts and DRE counts. So whenever we have, you know, different counting methods and, or different types of targets, safe states are not generally targets. Um, when elections aren't close, they're not likely to be targets for manipulation. So when we can compare targets with non-targets, or we can compare DRE tabulations, touchscreen tabulations, where there's no paper trail, with op-scan tra tabulations where there is a paper trail, or uh, computer tabulations with hand count tabulations, or with pre-election polls, or exit polls. I mean, those all then serve as baselines. And, you know, they're not perfect, but when you keep seeing really strong indicators and really strong repetitive patterns, it tells you at the very least um, that, that if we're going to have any real, real trust in our vote counting process uh, as the basis for democracy, we need to look deeper. And that's exactly what Jill Stein and the Green Party and Rocky Del Fuente and Clint Curtis and basically the whole election integrity movement is supporting now, which is a deeper look, which means the actual evidence, the actual voter mark, uh, paper ballots. And so we could look at election equipment the way they looked mm -hmm. at footballs in the NFL, impounded them, checked the air pressure. There, there was a thorough investigation. Here, there's every effort to block a thorough investigation, and that is what is particularly disturbing for anybody who values democracy. Well, I'll, I will put in uh, a mention of your, your great book, uh, Code Red, where you explain redshift in detail. And then we'll go on into Wisconsin. Did you see anything in Wisconsin, Michigan, any of these states uh, a couple weeks ago? Were you noticing interesting anomalies and burps and things like that? Yeah, well, on election night itself, I mean, there's always the brigade uh, ever since 2004, you know, and I, I feel that I was the, the, the first first trooper in that brigade to sit up and download or at the time just print out um, exit polls and before they got adjusted to match the vote counts. So we had a baseline to work with and been doing it ever since. So that was something uh, a number of us did on uh, election night 2016. And by, oh, I'm Pacific time, so, you know, by about 10 in the evening Pacific time, uh, we were looking at, you know, a spreadsheet. We basically got a spreadsheet. All right, here's how the vote counts are coming in. Here's how the exit polls came in. And we saw, you know, states that really stuck out like a sore thumb. And one of them was Wisconsin, um, where basically, uh, you know, in the exit polls, Jill Stein, up Jill Stein, Hillary Clinton, uh, won by uh, just about 4%. And uh, in the vote counts uh, at the time, uh, she it showed that she lost by 1%. So it was altering uh, of the outcome. If the exit polls were correct, um, then there was a reversal of outcome um, with the vote counts. So, you know, we had that in a few states. Um, we were very hampered uh, in Florida and Michigan in particular because those states span two time zones and they don't really, 
Uh, it's not an equal thing. There's a tiny little piece of each state um, in the central time zone, the rest of the states in the eastern time zone. But the impact of that, because of the agreement not to re release exit polls until all the polls close in the entire state, is that the polls that we were able to download, instead of screen capturing them, literally um, one minute after the closing of the polls, as we were able to do in almost all the other states, we had to wait an hour. So the polls in Florida and Michigan were already substantially um, adjusted towards matching, towards congruence with the vote counts uh, by the time we were able to capture them, which is one reason why we don't show anything particularly spectacular for Florida or Michigan. Um, but those are, if we had gotten those exit polls, uh, immediately after the poll closed in about 99 percent of the state, uh, we would have seen big red shifts there as well. Um, so we had states like Ohio, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, North Carolina, Florida, Michigan, all the biggies and all these states that um, Trump wound up winning, and in many cases by very small margins, they all showed um, significant um, redshift disparities and we had that very very um soon we had that by you know by midnight um on on election night and began to uh promulgate that to distribute it and send it out to people and say look we we've got a problem houston and we had a problem on the senate races as well after that is when the serious drill downs began into county level data as it became available and precinct level data as it became available and uh, real, you know, intense forensic investigation of the only thing that we had access to at that point, which was just numbers. We didn't have access to the machines. We didn't have access to the ballots. So people like Richard Hayes Phillips and J.Q. Jacobs and, you know, colleagues of ours, um, many new people to the field as well that we had never seen before, um, really got busy on that and, of course, you know, pulled up uh, more strange and anomalous um, results. And some of those were just, um, this was not exit poll comparison anymore. This was actually just looking at the vote totals and looking at the change from year to year um, and or comparing the vote totals with uh, registered number of registered voters. And, of course, a bunch of red flags came out of that, where you had more voters than you had, um, you know, more, more ballots, more votes than you had voters, um, or extremely high and suspect turnouts. On the other end of the spectrum, you had, in, like in Michigan, you know, 75,000 or so uh, undervotes, where people came out and voted for uh, every other, basically every other office on the ballot, and for whatever reason, no vote for president was recorded. Could have been a protest vote, but certainly equally uh, possible it could have been a computer not assigning their vote and uh, not recording their vote. So that those kind of things began to come out. And I think after about a week of that, um, the Stein campaign was, uh, you know, pretty much uh, on board. I mean, they, they looked at it. They, they didn't start out with any intention to uh, file for recounts. I, I, don't, I certainly don't think so. But when all this forensic data became uh, came out, um, and it, it became clear that the only real way we were going to answer these questions about what was causing this was by actually looking at the ballots. That's when they began um, these recount proceedings. Clarify something or go into the, a bit of the history here, not distant history, but. When did you contact well, you and your colleagues and, and mention some of them, please, because they deserve credit? Yeah. Start to contact, I believe they also contacted Ms. Clinton's campaign, John Podesta, and then the Stein campaign. How did that evolve? Well, you know, I, I've got to confess here, I've, I've been up about 20 hours a day for the last three weeks um, since. The, the, the day before the election, and uh, I was actually fairly busy before that, so I didn't go in fresh as a daisy. Um, so my memory of exactly how things happen is probably really fuzzy at this point. But okay. I will say that people um, who have been participants in election integrity in the past, um, and, and many of whom who had sort of gone into some degree of hibernation, um, because in between elections, nobody seems to be interested in, in you know, 
what we're what we're putting forward um, really jumped into the fray here and um, because it was so outrageous and it, these indicators were so strong. So, for instance, Emily Levy and Warren Winnie and Sally Castleman and Leanda, um, whose last name I cannot remember right now, but we formed a group called Recount Now and we started trying to raise money so that we could um, allow forensics experts and people with IT backgrounds um, who, you know, John Brakey, for instance, uh, who were, are eagle eyes and really could spot um, things that are, uh, are not kosher, um, either in the original count or in the recount process, um, to try to get them uh, pay their way and, and, and get them into the field in Wisconsin, in Pennsylvania, in Michigan. And so we made contact, you know, with the Stein campaign. It became clear they were going to file for these recounts. We said hallelujah. Um, this is definitely a step in the right direction. Um, you know, and, and frankly, at that point, a lot of us were, um, the press doesn't even begin to describe it, both because of the seeming lack of electoral, of election integrity, uh, and the fact that we were looking at a, at a hugely red flagged election, and also because the result of it, I mean, this was not your, your run of the mill election, and from just the standpoint of who was taking over and everything, I mean, we're human. And, uh, you know, we focus mainly on process, but we were also very concerned that a regime that would come in on under a Donald Trump and Republican hegemony would certainly not be friendly based on previous experience, uh, long previous experience, um, to any efforts to reform this vote counting system or any any aspects of the election system, making it easier to vote? No, it would become harder to vote. Making more access to ballots, making it more transparent? No, it would be going the other way. And there's, you know, just every indication of that. So we were pretty, um, you know, a lot of people were almost paralyzed with, with grief and despair. And they kicked in. Um, some of us just kept going. I mean, my method of choice in order not to, you know, succumb to despair was just keep working and just keep looking at numbers and working numbers and exposing patterns and writing and sending stuff and doing interviews, you know, and that kind of in a way kept me from looking at, you know, becoming um, overwhelmed by, um, by how enormous um, this whole, um, uh, this, this, this whole uh, sequence of events really was and, and what a dangerous place we were in. So, a lot of people joined, and, uh, you know, Recount Now grew. Obviously, the Stein campaign put out a call for funding, and they were restricted to relatively small contributions and, um, you know, raised $6.5 million in two days, which really indicates, you know, how much this permeates uh, the public and, uh, you know, how much people out there, and if you consulted the mainstream media, you'd never know this. You'd think we were a bunch of shit disturbers. Um, going out there to uh, make trouble, but among the people, um, you hear something very different, which is, yeah, I really wonder about this electoral system. I really wonder about this vote counting system. I'm not taking all these reassurances at face value that the government is giving, that the media is giving. We're really, you know, concerned and we're really glad you're out there trying to get a handle on it and trying to find out uh, the truth. Uh, and, and, you know, so there was a lot of support. Um, and then that enabled the, the, the Stein campaign and those of us who were ancillary in support of what they're doing um, to get into those states. And, of course, then, you know, the blowback came and it becomes an extremely partisan, very bare-knuckled fight uh, in which the, the goal um, for what I would have to term the enemy um, is to prevent these recounts from happening, making them prohibitively expensive, and run out the clock, uh, as was done in Florida in 2000, um, when uh, the recount was halted uh, on equal protection grounds. And then, uh, you know, the, the, the late uh, Justice Scalia said, well, you know, it, we, this recount is invalid, and it would really be great if you could go back and, and get it right. But, oops, sorry, we're out of time. Bush is president. So, you know, we've been down that road before, and, you know, where legal matters and litigation are concerned, um, the merits often are the least important thing, and what's really important um, is cost and time, and they've fought in every single way. I'll give you one example. 
I mean, the Wisconsin recount was billed at originally at uh, about $1 million. And that was based on, you know, the last statewide recount in 2011 was $600,000. So, you know, you throw in a little inflation, whatever, it's billed a billion dollars. When Jill Stein and her campaign raised all this money, the Wisconsin Election Commission got together and all of a sudden, uh, with no uh, justification, uh, boosted the bill to $3.9 million, basically multiplied it by four. I mean, if you went in to take your car into the shop and they told you it would cost 500 and you went to pick it up and they told you it was going to be 2000 you'd have a cow. So, you know, this was specifically um, to drain the funds and make it, I mean, it's blatant, it's obvious, um, to make it difficult or impossible to pursue the uh, other recount. And you take a county, for instance, uh, like Racine, the recount in 2011-2012, countywide, um, cost $1,800. The recount, they for, are billing, the recount for what? Um, I don't remember the race. They did a, they did a countywide recount of a okay. single race. Okay. It might have been the Kloppenberg race, um, which was a Supreme Court race. But it's it's one race on the ballot, which is the same thing they're the doing now. Then they, received, did a, yeah. they did a countywide, full-county hand recount and billed it at $1,800. They are now charging $119,000 to do a machine recount to put the ballots back through the same computers. Um, this is, you know, I mean, even the EpiPen, you know, didn't didn't uh, appreciate and value that that ridiculously. I mean, this is clearly and blatantly an effort to thwart the recount, and we're seeing it all around from the Trump forces, from the, those who control uh, the state uh, election boards, from some of the judges involved. And yeah, it's absolutely um, partisan and it's absolutely uh, inimical to all the principles of democracy um, and equal protection of the law, due process. Um, so this is the battle that's going on right now. And uh, I have to commend the, the Stein campaign. Um, I was uh, rather beside myself that they didn't go into federal court uh, in Wisconsin because it was a state court that had, had made these bad rulings um, and, a, and a very Republican judge, I have to say. Um, and uh, they didn't go into federal court, and I, I couldn't really quite understand. Uh, their budget was tight, et cetera, et cetera. But they are going into federal court in Pennsylvania, um, and uh, they, this will be tomorrow morning. Um, to uh, sue for a, a statewide recount, and they're going to wind up in federal court in Wisconsin because the Trump campaign basically has gone into federal court to try to stop the recount. So they're going to be in federal court there as well. These are tough, tough battles, um, and they're expensive battles, and, you know, that's why they had to raise all that money, and I think they still need to raise well, more, more in order to be able to afford this. They need more, and this is this is really important it is uh, I'll, it is very disappointing to see election officials that are supposed to be the guardians of our democracy stonewalling a citizen's effort to take a second look at the ballots and yeah. this is just i don't see election officials as the enemy but some of them are certainly not our friends and this is not good me... Yeah, in general, I agree with you, Jim. I mean, we don't, you know, election officials are generally trying to do a, a good job, but there are certain places um, that are crucial, uh, Florida in 2000, Ohio in 2004, uh, where the partisan stripes really come out and neutrality just is not seen. And, um, you know, these are, these are these, the catch-22 here is that we are, always always told i mean you haven't produced any evidence all you have is exit polls all you have is the red shift all you have this is all just numbers and uh you know it doesn't mean anything it's not evidence so we say okay let's look at the ballots that's the real evidence let's look at the voter mark ballots where they are in existence where they even exist this is the real evidence let's take a look Let's actually take a memory card out of one of these computers and have a group of IT experts analyze it and see what kind of code is actually counting these votes. That's the hard evidence. Yeah. And that is what they build a wall around and say, you cannot have access to that. You know, even uh, the public, forget it. Candidates, as you can see, they make it prohibitively expensive. 
Um, and even election administrators sometimes do not have access to the memory cards, to the code running on the computers because it is corporate property. And this is insane. This is insane. And uh, they, they say, well, what evidence, what proof? There's a difference between evidence. What proof do you have that the elections were stolen? And well, or, or at least that proof that you have that anomalies happen. And well, that's what the recount is about, is to get that evidence and find out if there is something. Let me, I'm going to throw uh, something uh, at you that I've seen on Facebook that the recount advocates are being accused of being tools of the Clinton campaign and tools of the the elite, the 99%. Do you feel like you're a tool of the 99%? Wait, the elite would be the one percent, would it not? I'm we're, sorry, we're, the one percent. The uh, you're the mathematician. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that that I feel. Yeah, I would love to be. I would absolutely be honored to be a tool of the ninety-nine percent. Uh, yeah. But I think what you meant was the tool of the one percent. The Clinton campaign and, um, and the one percent. You know, I, yeah. look. Do I know what goes on behind the scenes? I I really don't. But every indicator that I have, and I know Jill Stein personally. Um, you know, and I've presented with her, and I've, <laughs> I, this did not come from, hey, you know, we'll, we'll pay a, a, a fortune, the Clinton, you know, let's say from the Clinton campaign, uh, to, 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 to go in and do these recounts. Clinton could have gone in and done the recounts herself a lot easier. Uh, the, you know, Jill, this hasn't done Jill Stein's any health, health and longevity any favors going through this process. You know, Jill did this because she was informed by people like me and, and our colleagues and you and the, you know, the people we work with that there were real problems here and that there have been problems election after election after election from when those computers went in. And you know, this goes back now 15, 16 years and it's been unidirectional and it's had a profound impact on the politics of this country and the direction of this country and so you know a lot was at stake not you know not a victory for jill stein but wanting to shine a light into one of the darkest crevices and and, and you know and a darkness that has absolutely been protected by the political cast by the journalistic cast by the mainstream media even by the left-wing media has said no. You know, we trust that we you you have no basis for distrusting the elections. Just vote, go home, be entertained, and 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 you know, and then just wrap up by the by the great show that the networks put on, and then just you know, uh, just go on your way. And this is ridiculous. This is disempowering. This is disenfranchising. Jill got that, and she said, "Look, what we're asking for here is." One piece, one little piece of one election done transparently in the light. We'd love to have a whole election done that way. Our goal is to have an observable vote counting process. Is that really so crazy now? That's what, that's what we want. Is you just give us one election that's counted observably, and let's see where the chips fall. Let's see how, what the American people really, really are, are, are saying. We, at this point, we can't get that. We can get a sliver of this election and shine a light onto it and see what's happened. And, you know, recounts, as we've experienced, there's lots and lots of ways of manipulating and reading recounts. I mean, we've done recounts where ballot bags were open, they were misnumbered, there was pretty clear evidence that ballots were swapped out. And if the incentive to rig an election is X, the incentive to cover it up once a recount or an investigation gets underway is probably a thousand X. So, you know, recounts are, are not the most elegant tool, no. but it's all we've got. And it's, it's a dim flashlight, but it's at least casting a beam of light. And that's what we want to see go forward. All right. Um, we, we'll do a few more minutes with you and then we'll... we'll... Uh, go for talk with David Cobb, but I wanted to ask you one: Can you point to any specific counties or situations that are really raising red flags? And two: Where can people go to find this information? Websites, uh, Facebook pages. Where can they go to to learn 
about what's going on with the recounts. Um, and if, if our audience hasn't gotten the idea, John is really eloquent. His book, uh, Code Red, is eloquent. And you're going to want to get that. But for the moment, what, what should the recount effort, which places, counties, should they be looking at most closely? Where, where's the smoke coming from? And where can people yeah. get the information? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, I'll give you the, the, the uh, last one first. Uh, and that is that, you know, recountnow.org. Uh, we've got a head of steam up at this point, and there's a lot of information there. There's volunteer opportunities there. Um, so I'd suggest checking that out. Re Recountnow.org um, is, is, you know, is, is a good place to look. Uh, the Jill Stein campaign as well has a, has a recount page. It's probably something like jillstein2016.org slash recount. I mean, but you can just Google it. Um, and, you know, and they have, they have information as well. Um, we'd love to, you know, work with you at Recount now. Um, uh, we're, we're trying to build up something that we can carry forward then into the future because that's a real problem with elections. Is everybody gets very excited around election time, and especially if one smells this bad, but it, it, there's a lot of attrition as time goes on and you're looking at 2017 and 2018 and off-year elections, and there just isn't enough sustained, sustained pressure um, and it's going to take a lot of pressure now, especially if Trump, you know, stays in office, um, to, to move the needle. So that recountnow.org is a, is a good place to go. My book is actually Code Red, Computerized Election Fest and the New American Century, and that's available at Amazon. Um, and I also have a website. It's, it's codered2016.com, um, and uh, codered2016.com has... Uh, you know, also a fair amount of information um, and uh, is a good place to look. As far as, you know, uh, red flags and smelly places out there, I mean, there are three counties in Wisconsin uh, that immediately come to mind. And one is, I'm probably not going to pronounce it right, but Outagami County. Outagami. Um, I went to college. Outagami. Yeah. <laughs> and there's Brown and there's Rock County. And those three come up because the vote, uh, results are so radically uh, shifted from the not just the past election, but from the you know average uh, and the the, the uh, results that have been seen basically since 2000, um, and all of a sudden a huge shift over to Trump. And yeah, you know there are potentially benign explanations for that, but it's it's just a, you know a, a, a very very egregious anomaly, and um, they're not uh, permitting a hand count. These three counties have said, nope, we're just going to run them back through the same machines. So when I found that out, um, you know, after bursting a few blood vessels, um, you know, my sense was that that's where the rubber meets the road. That's, that's exactly where, you know, it, it, the battle is joined because, you know, these are really suspect counties. And they're saying, nope, we're not going to count by hand. Machines are so much more accurate, so we're just going to put it back through the same machines. There should be thousands of people at Sarah Hickey. She's the she's one of the county clerks there of one of those counties, Latagami County. They should be, you know, on those steps saying, "Those are our ballots. Let us count. Let us have a human count. Machines are more accurate. You're kidding. Isn't that what we're here to test? You know, I, there should be a massive um, demonstration and protest and encampment." Um, because it's time for that um, to, to force you to really, really put the pressure on um, to make this happen. So th those are three places in Wisconsin. You know, places in in um, in, in uh, Michigan, you know, where there were lots and lots of undervotes. Uh, Wayne County, you know, around Detroit, and a couple of others. I'm not clear, you know, what the what the cause or the source of that is yet. And that's being fought in Michigan, kind of at the state level. Um, to see whether the recount is going to actually go forward. Um, so the state house there and the, um, you know, and, and, and the, the, the media um, in Michigan is really important. And then over in Pennsylvania, um, there are a bunch of counties, Lackawanna County, Erie County, I think. Montgomery County refused to recount at all. And again, that's being taken up at the state level. That election has gotten a lot closer. 
Uh, it's now only about 40,000 votes. If it gets uh, another 15,000 votes or so um, shaved off of Trump's margin, it's going to trigger a statewide mandatory recount. So there's a real incentive for getting um, some of those states, uh, some of those counties, um, to actually count some ballots and see see what's going on there, because it might wind up with a with a statewide mandatory recount. That would be good. That would be very good. Uh, and free. <laughs> then it becomes a free recount, you know, because the race would be within 0.5 percent as an automatic trigger. Oh, okay. Uh, I didn't know that. It's it's not free. It costs money. But Virginia Martin, and who's an election director in Columbia County, New York, does recounts of close races on a regular basis, and she says that these uh, uh, a recount, a full recount of close races costs one percent of their budget, and that's it. Right. I mean, it, it bless their hearts. I mean, she and she's a Democrat, and her uh, Republican counterpart, their co-commissioners of Columbia County, uh, it's a relatively small county in New York, um, uh, Jason Nafke, that's her counter counterpart, they basically came together and, and bipartisan and basically said, look, you know, these, we know enough about these machines to know we can't trust the, the programming, we can't trust the results, we, we, we want to have confidence. So we're going to pull the ballots out of the op scans, uh, optical scanners, and actually count them when the races are close. And they do that. And, um, you know, I think it's a shining example for democracy. It's the only place in the country where they actually pull the ballots out of the scanners. I mean, there are some places that hand count from the beginning, just a few, but, um, you know, sprinkling of hand count places. But here's a place where they use the machines as they're mandated to in New York and then pull the ballots out and, and do this, do this routine, uh, recount. So it can be done. It is done. Um, and we, for that matter, could have hand count and paper ballots on election night um, if we weren't prepared to you know to go to that extent if there was too much resistance to that we could at least have a uniform national public audit that is done robust audit that is done scrupulously and yeah. observed the problem is that when you start getting away from election night and there's a delay you don't know what's happening with those ballots you don't know the chain of custody and you wind up with all these battles that are going on at different times as the kind of battle we're seeing over the recount now. If you can find that to election night, now granted, we've gotten very hyper-polarized and people have a hard time, you know, seeing eye to eye and even talking to each other, but this would actually force the two sides and their representatives and their publics to sit down and work cooperatively. Yeah, there'd be disagreements. Sure, there would be disagreements, but they'd actually have to go to work. And what we found, you know, social sci scientists, social psychologists find that when people work together, whether it's different races, different genders, old and young, when people have a common task, it brings out the best in them. The, 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 the bigotry and the prejudice and, the, and the, the animosities go way down. And people who might, in a different context, be really antagonistic, because they're working on a common, common project, a uh, common task, they brings out the better side of them, and they're cooperative. And so this could really be something that, you know, rather than being a burden, if humans actually had to count the votes, as they do in Germany and the Netherlands and Ireland now, countries that went back from the machines and went back to observable counting, um, it would bring out the best in us, and we could have a two-day holiday. We could have Election Day as a holiday. We could have the day following Election Day as a holiday, so we could stay up late. And so we could actually do this process and make it celebratory, make it congregational. You know, I know that sounds very utopian, but it's, it's something that communities do. And we've given up community in so many ways to go sit in front of our computer screens or our TVs or whatever and just be entertained. And we can see now, I mean, I think it's becoming really clear how much we've lost in that process. And that's part of what's tearing this country apart. And that is really, really something that we could start remedying by doing more things communally. And the very first one we should be doing communally is actually counting the votes on, a, on election night. Amen. 
Uh, okay. The name of your book is Code Red, and the website is... CodeRed2016.com. 2016recountnow.org. Recountnow.org. This is the Ballots for Bernie website. You you mentioned very much, and I know you and I, and I know Emily has really not let up. We've been working on this year in, year out, and we've got a lot of work ahead of us in the next couple of weeks, in the next couple of decades, because it's going to take that long. People, check out Ballots for Bernie. You can also check out the Voting Rights Task Force Facebook page, where we have one for California, one for the United States, where you're going to be seeing announcements about federal and state legislation coming up next year. We are going to need a, a lot of support from the public, from the same people that contributed so generously to this recount recom campaign to come back next year and, and tell our legislators, we need to get this better. We need to not have to go through this every four years of, of chaos and, and dispute. Let's do it right the first time. And then we can we can have a nice day after the election, which yeah, it should be a holiday, and we can go and can have a little party for the winners. And everybody would know the winner won. But we can't do that right now. And so that's really what the recount is about. Jonathan, any last words? No, just amen to all that. And we really need you. We really need people to be involved, stay involved. I really, you know, everybody says their issue is the most important, whether it's, you know, saving the whales or planting trees or anything. But this is an issue that underlies all of them, all agendas. Um, and, uh, you know, so we really need you. Okay. Thank you, Jonathan, very much. And also, um, these broadcasts and the conference that we held in October where many of the leaders of this recount movement were able to get together in, in Richmond, we're going to try to do that again next year, but it costs money. And we want, I would hope that you can go to GoFundMe.com slash Take Back the Vote and donate something to our coalition so that we can keep this work going also. For the moment, priority is Recount Now, the Jill Stein Recount Campaign. Let's get that going. But over the long term, there are groups that are going to be working to improve our democracy year in, year out. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Folks, we're going to go offline for a, 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 a bit. No. Uh, or oh. just oh, I see. No, we're gonna stay on, and we're gonna we're gonna FaceTime David Coven in about two minutes. Okay, we'll so be. So we're just summarize what we've been talking about while David calls in. Okay. You don't want to end, so no. we'll be just screwed. yeah, just uh, we don't want to end because we'll we won't we won't end changing we'll just... plans. We had a hiccup with with our B Live technology that worked once but didn't work the second time. You want to FaceTime him? He's ready. And um, just hang in out with us while we get David Cobb here on the line. And it should only take us a, a minute or so. So uh, while we do that, everyone, thank you so much for chiming in. This is Addie Olvera talking to you here with Jim Soper. We also have Jerry here who's helping us assist. Um, with this live streams and uh, she is the expert in uh, trying to get the split screen technology going and I think we've They're tested down. it we were pretty much successful and, and then we had a glitch with the Wi-Fi They're so, down tonight, so we will probably try it again on next weekend and we'll be good so thank you for bearing with our technology issues down. and um, okay. uh, we okay. will um, uh, get David pretty soon. David here. Jim Soper. Uh, work with Jerry for our interview. Is he FaceTiming? Because yeah. we can FaceTime. Are you ready? You could you could FaceTime him. Okay. Um he, he was ready to FaceTime if you want to FaceTime him. Hang on David. FaceTime. There you go. Jim do you want to FaceTime him and people can yeah. see his response. He's inviting him. Oh yeah, good. hang on. Um we're almost there folks but hang in. 
because I disconnected the Wi-Fi because we had hiccups. Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh, yeah, there we oh, go. Oh, that's right. That was a landline, the other one. Yeah. Are you there, David? No. I'm here. Oh, oh hey. And how do we get uh, FaceTime here? Go to this floor. Oh. Right. Wow. He just has to accept on his end as soon as he sees You need to accept on my end. You should get a notice. Um, the phone just rang. It did not ring, giving me the option of FaceTime. Okay, um, I would hang up one more time and then uh, call him again on FaceTime. I'm going to call you on FaceTime. Hang on, please. All righty. This is pretty exciting stuff. We're about to get an update from David Cobb on uh, the recount, and we just had Jonathan Simon from Code Red. He was uh, he's an amazing speaker. He also joined us at our conference at Take Back the Vote in October. And, and he was one of the election integrity experts who initially contacted Jill about the recon. He was one of the small team. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Thanks, Jerry, for that. So, um, uh, as you know, John, uh, John Simon has been an advocate and always getting everyone informed. So thank you, Jonathan, for, for helping us uh, move and lead the movement here. We are contacting David Cobb as we speak, and uh, we should be mm. going live with him in just a bit. Just do call back. He has your number in the phone, right? You just yeah. called him, so. Hmm. It was one more second. We're almost there. I'm texting him. While we get David on the on the call, one of the things that um, we get a lot of comments about, Jim, is people's frustration with wanting to recount the primaries. Can you tell us about how that is kind of impossible at this point? So just so people have an understanding of why we can't do that, or it's just hard, harder, um, and why it's important to focus on the recount that we have now. Um, and that would help us while we get on David on the phone. Yeah, one of the reasons, um, one of the reasons you can't recount the primaries now is because it is way past any effectiveness date. The uh, it depends on the state. People should be aware that in California, any voter can ask for a recount. They have to pay for it, but any voter can ask for a recount. In other states like Wisconsin, you have to be a candidate whose name is on the ballot. This is the case for Jill Stein, and I think that's true for Michigan, Pennsylvania. Um, but in California, anybody can. In the case of the primaries, it's just basically too late. You need there's a window between when the there's a window between. When the semi-official results, semi-final results were announced after the first part of the canvas, then the officials announce, okay, these are the results. And then you have so many days, four, five, six days, in which somebody can ask for a recap. And then that window closes. And we're way past that closing time for the primaries. 
and what what happened is a week ago Jill had to file in Wisconsin a week ago Friday and then uh, early this week in Michigan and Pennsylvania Clint Curtis just filed yesterday in Florida he's not a candidate but he's asking for a recount the rules in Florida are different uh, and I'm not totally sure about this but I think it's the Secretary of State that it really has to call for a recount and no individual citizen can but Clint is, is filing suit and Rocky De La Fuente is asking for a recount in Nevada and that happened next week there's a certain uh, window open for when you can do this and it's way past that in the primaries and in many states for those of you who felt that Bernie sh should have asked for a recount in some states he had to be the person to do that and he didn't Jill Stein's name is on the ballot in Wisconsin her name is on the ballot in in Pennsylvania it's not on the name in it's not a name that's on the ballot in Nevada, but Rocky De La Fuente's name is on uh, the ballot in Nevada, so he's filing in in uh, Nevada. So there's a lot of complicated rules in California. We like to or don't like to talk about the fact that we have 58 county chaos. We also have 50 state chaos, and I think about 9,000 counties and generally counties are fiefdoms and they run their own show um, and you have to address each county and it is really chaos and makes it hard to follow what's going on but the rules are there and we want to streamline them make them more efficient but for the moment we can um, <laughs> We, we're doing what we can and for the moment you are seeing now through the magic of phones looking at phones you're seeing David Cobb and he's on FaceTime hi David hi David um, he's now let me see if I plug in him somewhere yeah we're gonna plug him so we can make you louder where hang on Where's your sound plug? It should be right here, actually. More, more to the left. Uh, oh, okay. I can see in there. Um, David, I'll try to speak up. David is was the campaign manager for Jill Stein. He's a past candidate for president for the Green Party, and we're still doing technology here. Um, this is why we always want things on paper ballots. <laughs> uh, you take it out of the case. Okay, just put the volume loud. Yeah, it'll be fine. Okay, so David, you were you were a candidate for president, correct? At what point? That's right. I was the Green Party nominee in 2004, and I actually demanded recounts in the state of Ohio that year. And, and New Mexico. And New Mexico. And did you find anything? Well, I mean, uh, what we found was a profound problem associated with the election process, and we helped to launch uh, or nurture a growing election integrity movement in this yeah. country. Uh, we actually sent two election administrators to jail that year. We stopped the proliferation of the DRE machines, which were sweeping the country associated with the Help America Vote Act. Uh, yeah. We are responsible for the fact that California went through a, quote, top-to-bottom review of its voting system, culminating in the abolition of DRE, so-called black box voting machines in the state of California. Uh, we were also responsible for the abolition of black box voting in Maryland and in New Mexico. And in New Mexico, thanks to the uh, Green Party recount uh, coordinator who is now coordinating Michigan for us, Rick Lass, uh, he's from New Mexico, he coordinated there. Uh, not only did they uh, <coughs> abolish uh, DREs and have full paper ballots, but in addition to that, they have the single best mandatory audit process uh, of any uh, of any state in the country, 
And in addition to that, uh, two years later, they initiated a uh, mandatory state-funded recount process in any election for either state, uh, statewide, or state legislative office that had a margin of victory of 0.5% or less, and they've already actually used it twice. So uh, when people ask about the value of recounts, I say, uh, look, if we're going to actually have confidence in the integrity of the election results, recounts uh, are absolutely critical. Uh, And simply by fighting the fight that Jill Stein is engaged in in this election cycle, we know from past experience profound positive things can come out of it. Because I also want to go one step deeper and say for Jill Stein, David Cobb, and all of us working on this recount uh, as representatives of the Green Party, what we know and understand is this. Uh, This is just the first step to democratize elections in the United States of America. We have an election system that is a fraud. It's a farce. Yes, of course we have to count every vote, but we also have to make sure that every vote counts. We have to recognize we need to have full publicly funded elections. We need to implement ranked choice voting and proportional representation. We have to end the racist Uh, system of felony disenfranchisement uh, that is targeting poor people and people of color, especially young African-American men in this country. We have to guarantee access to the ballot and to the debates. We have to make sure uh, that there is a system in this country where voting is actually a way that we can transform the society. So for us, this is just the first step in a process of what we call voting justice. It's the first step. Uh, I'm not going to let you uh, get away totally with taking credit for the California stuff. The Voting Rights Task Force in Alameda County in 2006 uh, pushed hard against Diebold machines in Alameda County, and we threw Diebold out of the county in November. That was the first election where almost the entire county voted on paper ballots. That was also the no, election. There's no doubt about it. I want to yeah. be clear. Like, I think that the, <laughs> the, uh, the Cobb 04 recount in 2004 helped to provoke a, a, a people all yeah. across the country. Yeah. Humboldt County, where I now live, uh, also uh, abandoned the DRE machines and actually is the first county in the entire country now that actually uh, scans... Uh, the ballots themselves and make those uh, uh, scanned images available to the people so that they can do their own 100% on it, right? So Alameda County, of course, as you well know, uh, citizen activists, apparently y'all and others uh, were responsible uh, for at the county level. And it culminated, again, in in that top-to-bottom review that happened actually uh, in 2008, I believe. So it took about four years of hardcore organizing, and I am absolutely not going to take any credit for it, okay. because what I know as a social change agent, nobody ever has success alone. Right, uh, you right, know, right. The reality is social movements make change in this country, and that's my appeal to folks who are watching this uh, technology right now is to recognize it's great that you're getting educated. That's the first step. And getting educated in this system ought to get you pissed off, which is the second step. And then the third step is you got to get active, right? Yeah. So get educated, get pissed off, and then get active. Well, I I will riff on that. Uh, we've been done a couple of these Sunday interviews, and every time I've you know, I've been suffering from PTSD, which is President Trump stress disorder. And every time we get done with that, we, we finish one, I feel better. It really helps to get out and do things with people. And There's no doubt about it. Look, it, it we just, have to be very clear about something. And that is that Trump is a proto-fascist. He actually represents something profoundly dangerous. And as a white person, I have to be a, a willing to not only say, but then act on that information. Yeah. Which is to say, we now know that people of color and immigrants and Muslims and queer people and women and poor people uh, are all at risk and we have got to actually come together and the Green Party will not go quietly into that good night. The Amen. Green Party will not accommodate Trump. We will resist Donald Trump. We will fight Donald Trump and his 
racist neo-fascist agenda. Uh, you know, we are not in a mood. Uh, let the Democrats actually be the one to accommodate. Uh, let the Democrats be the one to give him a chance. I'm not giving somebody like that a chance because I know what he represents. Exactly. Let's get into the recount a bit. What is your role in in this entire recount effort now? So I am the campaign manager of the recount effort. Uh, you know, uh, so what that means is I am overseeing not one, not two, but literally three recount efforts. Uh, that means the legal uh, teams I am responsible ultimately uh, for. I am also responsible for the election observer apparatus. I am responsible for the uh, national campaign strategy. Uh, as you probably know, we have now gone into federal court in Pennsylvania, so we're escalating the fight in Pennsylvania to guarantee st- or to, to fight like hell for a statewide recount because of the outrageous system that they use in Pennsylvania. We're also in court already in Wisconsin and in Michigan uh, attempting to get our hands on the machines. Uh, In Wisconsin, they use both touchscreen or the black box voting machines and optical scanners. In uh, Florida or in Michigan, it's a lot better because they only use the optical optical scans, but they still need our uh, embedded computer technology uh, so uh, we wanted, we're, we're, we've got forensic experts uh, who want to get our hands on those. So we're fighting in the court to get the statewide recounts. We are fighting in the courts. Uh, and by the way, the Trump campaign uh, has attacked viciously trying to prevent it. We actually beat them in Michigan. We beat them in Wisconsin. Uh, we are now in a second round of litigation trying to get our hands on the machines in those two states. Uh We uh, are now going into federal court uh, in Pennsylvania. Oh, and guess what? Tomorrow, fast-breaking news, 10 a.m., Jill Stein, myself, uh, our lawyer, and multiple uh, voters are having a press conference in front of Trump Tower. So when I say that we're taking the money to Donald Trump, it's it's not just rhetoric. We are coming for them. Uh, you're coming for them. You, they will be at 10, 10 a.m. in Manhattan in front of Trump, Trump Tower is the, um, is, the, is the press conference. And yeah, uh, I like the idea. This is in your face. Um, and this live stream, by the way, is... Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Oh, are you going to live stream that press conference? Yes, how can it'll they, be how live can streamed they, on Jill Stein's uh, uh, Facebook page. Her Facebook page, Jill Stein's Facebook page. Okay. Can you explain so what... So I do, I do feel like I need to let you know that I have to get off the call in four minutes. All right. Well, that'll be at 7.30. Um, if people want to help, what's the most important... What are the ways they Listen, can help? At this point, I, I hate to say it, but the most important thing now is we are uh, still uh, about two million dollars away from our goal. Uh, that goal, so go to Jill twenty sixteen dot com and make a donation, even a small one. Our average donation is actually forty six dollars, uh, which is an amazing expression of grassroots organizing. And the reason that we have to actually do that is because, again, uh, it's taking millions of dollars in attorney's fees and millions of dollars. Uh, in filing fees. And, you know, we thought that we would be uh, through fundraising by now, uh, but the state of Wisconsin, the last statewide recount was only $800,000. We talked to the election administrators to get an estimate. We talked to attorneys. Everybody said, look, a million dollars should cover it. So we allocated uh, and raised $1.1 million specifically for the Wisconsin recount. On the day that we had to file, they charged us $3.5 million. And I am proud to say that the Jill Stein campaign did not blink an eye. We turned on a dime uh, and we paid that money. But that means we have to continue to fundraise. So, you know, that's the first thing that you can do. The second thing you can do is if you're in Michigan or Pennsylvania or Wisconsin, go to that website. 
uh, and click on uh, the specific state because we are still using and training and, uh, and utilizing election observers uh, in those three states. The third thing that you can do is to use your voice, your own Facebook, uh, your own social media to get the word out against the corporate media that is lying about what is going on. You know, we are already building an election integrity movement, as you well know, because you're part of it. Uh, but the corporate media is trying to pretend like everything's fine. But the reality is we do not have a voter verified uh, 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 a system in this country. So we are fighting for voting justice in this country, and we've got to raise our voices. We've got to raise our demands. And frankly, we've got to raise our aspirations. And that, I think, is what the Green Party represents, the electoral arm for growing movements for peace, justice, democracy, and ecology in this country. Okay, great, David. Uh, folks, stay on, but David has a, another call to get to. I do. Thank you so much. I just want to thank you so much because the reality is this entire effort is being driven by people like you, ordinary citizens doing the work of building a movement. And as my friends in the hip-hop world have taught me to say, hey, stop won't stop. <laughs> Hang in there, brother. Peace. Thank you, brother. Take care. Thank you. Okay. Um, you can go to jillstein2016 or jill2016.com. You need to volunteer? To volunteer. Okay. So it's, um, well, for vol they really need volunteers. Did he say which states? All states? All three. If you live in any of these states, if it's Pennsylvania, go to jill2016.com slash recount PA. If you're in Michigan, jill2016.com slash recount MI. And the last one you can figure out. And so there you can sign up. W-I. <laughs> um, that's it. And then the for oh. um, the... I'm not sure where to donate. To donate, it's the same place. I think. To donate. Okay, so so jill2016.com slash recount, right? Okay. Now, your donations for the, that goes through the Green Party. Jill has said that if they have money left over, it will be put into funding election integrity work in the future, and I believe they will do that. The There are numerous of our colleagues that, again, came to our conference in October who will put that money to good use. Roque de la Fuente has filed for a recount in Nevada. That's an opportunity for many people in California to get over there. I don't have any specific information about how to volunteer that, but we will try to get that up on the Ballots for Bernie page as soon as we, we get it. And again, this was breaking last night or uh, yesterday, Clint Curtis. Clint Curtis, many of you will recall, was the programmer in Florida that was asked to write a computer program to cheat on elections. And he thought, oh, this is a demo project. Uh, when the Speaker of the Florida House said, uh, no, we really want to do this, then he said, he backed off and said, nothing doing. And then he went, and there's a film you can video if you look for Clint Curtis, C-U-R-T-I-S. You'll find him testifying, testifying before a committee of the House of Representatives about this, that he had been paid to create a system to actually rig votes. Well, since then, he became a lawyer. And yesterday, he filed suit in Florida to try to force the Florida government to start a recount there. And this is new, and if they do, we're going to need observers there. Stay tuned. Stay tuned to Ballots for Bernie. Bernie. You can also find information on, on websites such as Occupy Rigged Elections or, rigged, or um, uh, Election Integrity are, are two of them that I'm, I'm involved in. I was Saturday night, and it, the news was just pouring in about Pennsylvania and Florida, and what am I doing on Saturday night? I'm passing on the news. Um, and it's going to be coming in heavily over the next few weeks still. If you're in Manhattan, if you're in New York, 10 a.m. tomorrow at the Trump Tower in Manhattan, go and watch Jill's 
press conference and let Trump know that you agree with Donald Trump. The elections can be rigged and we need a recount. That's what Mr. Trump said before and now he's saying, oh, well, no, everything's fine except for the two million votes that were illegal votes, but everything's fine and I don't know what he's saying. We need to be clear about what we're saying. We have to have these ballots counted. Um, do we have any questions coming in? I have a comment by Natalia Reyes. She says, I can't believe my elections board determined no recounts were required because those who filed affidavits did not pay filing fees. I was not asked about no filing fees. That was a general comment. I'm not sure where Natalia lives, but if she's... Um, Sounds like Pennsylvania. Yeah. It would be nice to see uh, what county she's in. Um, Nadia wanted to know, and I know David's not on the call anymore, how much funds uh, we still have available for recount and possibly might be easier to, under, to know that, um, to get that information about how much more we have to raise is probably it. They're asking for nine and a half million. I think they're about two million away from that now. Okay. They had to raise the bar because states like Wisconsin raised the, they quadrupled the price tag mm -hmm. from previous recounts. And so we have to adjust. One thing I said before, or when this all broke out a week and a half ago, is that this is going to be messy. You cannot have... A, a complex project such as recounts in three states and a couple hundred counties. You cannot have a complex project like this all go according to plan because a month ago they didn't have a plan because we didn't know what was going to happen in the election. This is necessarily going to be messy. But keep working at it. A volunteer, donate. This is a huge opportunity for us to check the votes, to check the actual ballots, uh, and, and see what they actually said. And yeah, the opposition is stonewalling, and this is very disappointing. Uh, but we have to keep pushing, and we will get there. But it's going to take a lot of effort and a lot of patience, uh, because it's necessarily messy. Do we have any other comments or questions off of the... Oh, off of our pages. I think we're good. We had, uh, I know there was one comment about ranked choice voting. Um, David mentioned that that's part of the platform of the Green Party. That's where you can select your first, second, and third choice, and they count the first choices, and then you elim eliminate the person who got the least amount of votes, uh, go to the second choices on those ballots, and keep cycling through until somebody gets 50%. This is part of the Green Party's platform because it's one way for small parties to have a chance to actually win an election, which right now it's it's just a top two system. It that worked in in Oakland a few years ago for a mayor's election. And San Francisco and Oakland and San Leandro use it and it's it's worth worth investigating. Uh, we'll talk I think we will do a a live stream about that next year and get into some of the details about that because that and some other systems are very interesting alternatives. But for now, let's stay focused on these recounts. Let's stay focused on getting these ballots counted. Thank you very much. Anything? I have one thing. Is it still yeah. on? Yeah. Uh, okay. I mentioned earlier <clears throat> the links for people. Yourself. Oh, Jerry Engberg with Voting <laughs> Rights Task Force. And I mentioned earlier the three links for signing up to be volunteers in Pennsylvania, Michigan, or Wisconsin. Um, the other thing you can do is, um, here, I'm going to put them here. Can you see it? Yep. Post these. So post these on your own Facebook page or anything you're connected to so that you can keep go getting the information out that they need volunteers. And also keep posting the other one, jill2016.com slash recount. Post it everywhere, keep sharing it, post it on pages you're connected to, to get more people to donate. Yeah. So Jim, uh, Chris Pat just joined us, and he's Hi. saying, um, how can we ban hackable electronic voting machines in each of our states? He has another question that says, how can we do away with provisional ballots? 
that largely go uncounted? And how can we go about demanding exit polls in every state? How about we try one of those three? Which one would you like to start with? Uh, you're not going to ban electronic uh, equipment throughout the country. It's just not going to happen. Um, San Francisco had 60 votes on their ballot. And it, we need to double check the count, but an initial account, you can't hand count those in the precincts. And Ray Lutz and Virginia Martin and a number of people, there was there's discussion, there will be more discussion. Uh, when you have situations like that, it's, we need to use those machines to get an initial count. And then we do need to have a very thorough audit of the chain of custody and then of the ballots and try to get the ballot images available so that, you know, here, here are the images, count them yourself. Um, and that's something that uh, we're going to be pushing for in the next few years. It's, it, it's, it's relatively new, but actually get images of the ballots so anybody can count them. Um, watch for initiatives at Voting Rights Task Force California, Voting Rights Task Force US, Facebook pages. We'll talk about that. With regard to provisional ballots, we didn't have them in 2000. And- So it's a fairly new thing. It's a fairly new thing. And we needed them, the election would have been changed in 2000 because when people were going to the polls, they were being told, you're not registered. And they couldn't vote. So one of the effects of Florida 2000 was to create the concept or to create provisional ballots and to let you vote and your vote goes into an envelope and they double check to see if really you were registered and there was some kind of hiccup otherwise uh, in the system. So it's, they don't all be counted. They shouldn't all be counted because not everybody is actually registered to vote. But um, it's a backup system, and uh, it's good that's there. What we need to focus on is really getting the voting register, voter registration databases working properly. In California, this was the first year that it went online statewide, and there were a lot of problems with it. And the voter registration databases were confirmed hacked by the FBI but in Illinois, Arizona, and Riverside County, California. This is a big weakness in California. These registration databases are not checked. They're not certified. They don't go through testing. And we're seeing now that they're vulnerable to hacking. That should not have been any surprise to anybody who understood computer systems. I saw that coming 10 years ago. But we already had enough to deal with. We're going to have to make this a bigger issue so that those systems become more secure. But the backup so for when things go wrong are those provisional ballots. Or auditing of the provisional ballots? That's a different, different issue. We had a, um, we need to get them audited. Ray Lutz in San Diego discovered that the San Diego Register was not auditing all of the vote by mail and provisional ballots. They're subjecting them to the audit. We have in California 1% manual tally where they select 1% of the precincts in the county and check all the votes and all the ballots in those precincts. Well, they didn't, they randomly select which precincts, but the, but the provisional ballots and the vote by mail ballots were not included in all of them, not all of them were included in, in that, that audit. And Ray just went down to the courthouse and said, no, that's not right. And he filed suit. And a couple of weeks ago, the judge came back and said, you know, from the wording of the law, and I tend to agree with the, the judge, it's rather clear that you do have to audit all vote by mail ballots in California. Provisional is another question. And I think this week the judge is going to have more to say on that. Uh, but what we need to do is to make sure that the laws say that when you do a check, when you do the audit, you have to do that for the vote by mail and provisional ballots too. And that includes checking those that were not accepted for counting. 
that for provisional ballots, the officials said, well, yeah, you're not registered, so no. Well, we need to check those that got put into the no pile and see if they really were correctly disqualified or not. So there's a lot of complicated steps that go on in conducting election. I said this before, the registrars, the election officials have a terribly complex job and the public does not understand this. Um, and it gets easier to point finger, fingers when things go wrong, but it's a terribly complex job and we need to go through step by step through all of these steps and make them clear, understandable, and transparent and make sure everything is subject to checking, to audits. Until that time, we're going to have to keep on insisting on recounts. Do we have any other questions? I think his last question was um, about demanding exit polls in every state. Is that easy to do or? Who's going to pay for the exit polls? Right. We How are they going to conduct it? Right now the exit polls are conducted by the big three networks. In Florida in 2000 there were several exit polls and each major network had their own polling company and so on. And then I don't know if it happened before or after, after Florida 2000, but then the three major networks said, we're going to use the same company and we're going to all share all the exit polling data for those. So I believe the company is called Edison Research. Uh, they do it, so it's not a good idea to have a single source for your data. And in this case, that's what the networks are doing. Not good. We need more of it. Um, and we also need Buffett Trachis and others, uh, I believe it's Harvey Wasserman or Sewitt, not Harvey, but people in Ohio, have a racketeering lawsuit to force the exit polling company to publish their raw data, that is the actual questions and answers that the poll takers uh, got when they st stand outside of a polling place and they ask questions. What is that raw data? Right now, Edison Research will not publicize that. And instead, they massage the data. They, they make adjustments for demographics and who votes by mail or not. But as Jonathan Simon was talking about, a redshift, uh, something funny happens. The exit polls over the evening and over the weeks get adjusted. And funny thing, they all seem to be adjusted to agree with what the official results are instead of asking the question, are the official results right? And that's why we need the raw data so that experts can look at it and try to determine if we have any red flags coming up there. We should have exit polls. I think part of what the questioner is getting at is that when we look at elections in other countries, um, we often exit poll people in other countries. And if there's just a percentage of two variance between the official results and the exit polls in the Ukraine and Venezuela and other countries, then the government, US government is inclined to say, well, that election wasn't fair. We need to do that in our own country. And it's not happening. So the question is fair, and we need to have that happen. And that's part of a, what would be a, a good audit, is to ask the people as they're leaving, who did you vote for? Uh, and then we cross-check and use that as an indication where there might be some questionable areas where not necessarily vote stealing, but anomalies are happening, things happen in complex systems. Yeah. Uh, we need, yeah, we need those exit polls too. Chris asked a question about how do you feel about publicly funded elections, but my understanding our taxes do pay for elections. So I'm not sure um, what the context of the discussion about how you feel about Our taxes pay for elections. the administration of elections. They pay the election officials and election departments and the Secretary of State's office. What they do not pay for is the campaigns. And we've had, I'm not sure if that's still true now, but Maine and Arizona, 
would allow candidates to have their campaigns funded out of taxpayer money uh, on the condition that they don't take large donations from private corporations, from private people. If you publicly funded campaigns, then that's where your money is coming from. Uh, it really would work. It did work well. It does work well. I'm not sure of the status now, but other countries do help pay for the campaigns, and you don't go into this ridiculous cycle where somebody wins a seat in the house, and the next day they're contacting people for donations for the next campaign. They spend a quarter, a third of their time doing nothing but raising money. And I, I, I've seen interviews with a legislator in Arizona, and she said, you know, it's fabulous. I had a publicly funded campaign. I can talk to people about what I want to do. And then when I go to do my job, I don't have to make phone calls to people to get them to donate. I can focus on the people's business, which is where their entire focus should be. So, yeah, we need that too. And that would help clean the swamp that people have been calling for. The swamp is because people have candidates have to go out and get donations for their campaigns. If they have sufficient amount of money coming from taxpayer money, we would ultimately save money by getting reducing the corruption, by reducing the special interest lobbying and letting our elected officials focus on actually taking care of the people's business. So, yeah, that's yet something else that we can do and should do. Anything else? Okay, well, um, have a good rest of your weekend here. Thank you all for listening, and we will see you in a week. Thank you, everybody, and just please share this website and um, help us reach this information, uh, reach more folks so they become aware of what we're trying to do, help spread the love, help spread the conversations with David Cobb and um, John Simon, uh, who wrote uh, Code Red. And um, watch us again. We try to do this every Sunday. Occasionally we take a break, but we try to do this um, and connect with experts in election integrity so that um, we have the information and you have the information. And if we can do anything, any small contribution is at mm -hmm. least get this information out to you um, via you know Jim Soper's um, knowledge and his connections with other election integrity experts that are working on these recounts who are working on legislation um, Jim is going to be working on drafting language that we could work on uh, in protecting our elections in the state of California we're going to want your feedback we're going to try to mobilize California and ins inspire other states to do the same so please keep watching us like our page Ballots for Bernie um, so that we can uh, stay connected and work together as a force. Thank you, Jerry, for being with us today. Mm -hmm. She is perfecting the split screen live streams, and hopefully next week we'll be able to get it right. So uh, thank you all. Thank you for joining us, and we will see you in a week. Have a happy week out.